Well, first of all, I want to tell you that um, I want to bring greetings from a number of people. First of all, is that very Susan that he just spoke of. I would not be here this evening if it wasn't for her. I wouldn't be a minister of the gospel if it wasn't for God, surely, but he used Susan a great deal along the way to make sure that all transpired. Um, she has been my helpmate in so many ways. Uh, and after this is all over this evening, she will be my helpmate again because she'll tell me uh, whether I did a good job or not. So. <laughs> I also bring you greetings from Solo Publishing Company, where I am serving a call to specialized ministry uh, from my denomination to Solo Publishing, which serves your denomination and others as well. And I want to say from the outset why I'm working there, why I feel even though I have this call to serve in the parish all the time, and so I'm serving as uh, an interim pastor at the same time, the work of Sola is so important to the work of the church is why I'm there. If we do not have uh, faithful, orthodox, biblical, traditional, cent centrist, if you will, teachings for our kids and for our adults, for that matter, the Lutheran church is in trouble, in my opinion. Um, I think that a great deal of the reason that we found ourselves in the sorry shape that we have whittled down to over the past uh, 30 years or so is because the material that was disseminated from publishing houses to our people slowly eroded the base of who we are. And the message that I want to bring to you tonight is kind of wrapped around that idea that we have to be true to the true gospel not to a social gospel, not to a political agenda, not to a power structure, a denominational power structure, if you will, but true to the gospel, the eternal gospel that we have been called to preach that I want to speak to you about this evening. So we have to preach the word, and one of the ways that we have faithfully done so as Lutherans for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years is by preaching the word through the catechism. Now, again, this is just my opinion, but I would be happy to have a conversation with you to back it up. Um, I, th I think that Lutherans, including lots of Lutherans in the NALC and the LCMC, not just uh, other de Lutheran denominations, we've kind of lost our moorings. I remember saying to my dad uh, uh, many years ago uh, when he asked me if I would uh, come home to the Lutheran church and be a pastor in the Lutheran church, I said, essentially, when they believe in the word of God again, I will. Strong words, huh? He said, well, we read the Word of God every Sunday in church. He kind of took offense to it. I'm kind of glad. And I said, will you read that, those parts of the Word that you don't find offensive? Lots of the Word that you used to read on Sunday mornings, you've excised as though you were uh, newly minted Thomas Jefferson's. Cutting out those things that you find unreasonable, socially unacceptable, culturally incorrect. And when you restore the whole word of God, I will come back to the Lutheran church. And that's why I'm now a Lutheran pastor again, because I found Lutheran churches where the whole gospel is preached. May we ever preach that gospel or we are sunk again. The reason we lost sight of that verily, verily of the gospel is because we lost the Lutheran confessions. Somewhere along the line, we were taught slowly and in, 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 insipidly that this was no longer relevant. These things that were written hundreds of years ago by those Lutheran reformers have nothing to do with us today. May, many of you may not know that uh, some of our counterparts in another denomination, another Lutheran denomination, have dispensed with the small catechism altogether. It's no longer used in their churches. It has nothing to say to us anymore, you will be told. And I say that preaching the word through the catechism and the Lutheran confessions gives us an anchor in the word, a guide in the word that keeps us from getting shipwrecked. You know, there are people that read the word of God all over the world and end up shipwrecked. They go crazy in the word because they have no guide. They have no moorings. They have no anchor. And so they just sail off to anywhere and shipwreck, shipwreck others along the way. May that not be our story 
as these new Lutheran churches. May we be faithful to the eternal gospel. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, speak, I beg you. Open hearts and minds to understand the scriptures, not least of all, my own. I ask it in the holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Before I jump into the scripture, I want to recommend a few books to you, especially pastors who are present, but uh, for the laity especially, I want to recommend this biography, a relatively recent biography on Martin Luther by Eric Metaxas. Uh, it's, a, it's a little thick. Uh, the type's not too small, not too large. It's readable. Um, and in this, you not only get a history and a theological history at that, but it's very well told with lots of nice, fresh turns of phrase. And if you've read Here I Stand or any other biographies of Luther, I recommend this to you as a fresh reading on the life of Luther. There's lots of new stuff in it. And one of the things that I want to read to you is just a little history on page 76 of uh, Frederick. Frederick was the uh, elector of Saxony. We might think of him as a, as a kind of uh, governor, but it was a very... Um, very political um, kind of a post, as you would expect, but I mean lots of power, more power than we like to think of uh, as politicians ought to have these days, but we fear they do anyway. So this is from uh, his story. Now, Frederick was the, uh, the elector of Saxony, and in Saxony was Wittenberg, and I want to be perfectly clear for you, since we're talking about the Reformation, Wittenberg was a backwater, podunk, little burg of nothingness when Martin Luther was sent there. It was nothing. I don't know what you've got around here that would be uh, analogous to that, but you're probably forming it in your minds. It's on the other side of the tracks, as we might say, way on the other side of the tracks, and Frederick was interested in building up Wittenberg into something special. And one of the ways that he did this, one of the ways he thought he could do this, and he, for a while he was very successful, was through the acquisition, the collection of relics. Now, relics were, well, let me just read for you. It'll become clear. Frederick's collection of relics grew and grew as the years passed, becoming the magnet that attracted innumerable pilgrims and their money to this city so far off the beaten track. Already in 1509, Lucas Cranach created 124 woodcut illustrations for a catalog of the relics that pilgrims could purchase to guide them through the endless maze of these curiosities and treasures. Masses were constantly being said in the castle church so that people could view these relics, which were also a healthy source of income. The number of masses recorded for 1517, now this is the year that Luther famously nailed his 95 theses to the castle church door. In that year, in that year in Wittenberg, where the Reformation started that we celebrate today, in that year, in that very city, in that very church, in 1517, the number of masses were recorded at about 9,000 masses. The records also indicate that during these masses, 40,932 candles were burned, amounting to some 7,000 pounds of wax, by 1520, there were 19,013 relics in Frederick's collection, and it had been carefully calculated that those who visited these relics on the day appointed and made whatever contributions were required were able to shorten their own time in purgatory or the time of a loved one by nearly two million years. The exact number tabulated was 1,902,202 years and 270 days. That's pretty precise, isn't it? 
Isn't it interesting to know that we know exactly what it takes in the church of Luther's time to escape from purgatory, but not to be saved? Now, in Frederick's relics, there were no less than 15 splinters from the actual cross of Jesus. Imagine. At least that's what the catalog said. I have heard from somewhere that if you put together all the splinters that were held in all the collections, the bonfire would be still burning since 1517. They weren't real, in other words, but they brought in the money. People would pay good money to see these things and to have time taken off their life or the life of a loved one in purgatory. There was an actual hair from Christ's beard in Frederick's relics. Now, you can imagine if you came and stared at that during the right mass being said, how much time might be taken off in purgatory. The hair of Mary's head. In a vial, four drops of her breast milk. Why the baby Jesus didn't just drink it is beyond me. <laughs> but it ended up in Frederick's collection. And the list goes on and on, and these were the things that people believed would shorten their time in a non-existent location called purgatory. Now, why is that important for us to reflect upon today? For this very reason of how we get the word purgatory. Purgatory, we get the word purgatory from the same word that we get the word purge. Now, reflect on that for a moment. It's not hitting anybody. About midnight, you'll get it. <laughs> we don't need to purge ourselves of sins. That's the point. There is no reason for a purgatory for people who do not need to purge their sins. We don't need all the relics in Frederick's collection, all the re relics in the Pope's collection, all the relics in all the collections to purge us of our sins. Do you know why? Because by faith, you heard the words of Jesus pronounced to you earlier this evening when you were purged of your sins. You were absolved of your sins, and not just some of them, all of them, of all of you. And even me. We are already purged of our sin by virtue of what Christ has done. Now that's good news, isn't it? Isn't it good news that you don't have to pay money to go look at some foolish collection or do any other kind of good works in order to be saved? Now, to the New Testament lesson this evening. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead. Isn't it nice to know exactly where that angel is? Directly overhead. Now, I want to make sure that you understand the nuance that I hear in the reading this evening. Who is directly overhead of you this evening? Look up here. Oh, you got that one sooner than midnight, did you? <laughs> an angel. An angel is in your midst. Wow, you're getting more out of this Reformation service than you thought you were going to get, aren't you? That word angel comes from a Greek word, angelos, and it doesn't mean angel. We've just transliterated into English what that word angelos means to us in English. And we get all kinds of visions of winged creatures and that sort of thing. But really, lots of times in the New Testament, and even in the Old, when it talks about this kind of being, it's not talking always about some heavenly being, but just a messenger. For that is what angelos, that is what angel means a messenger. So let's hear it again. Then I saw another messenger flying directly overhead. Another messenger. Now it changes, doesn't it? It doesn't have to be a winged being, does it? It could be in a 747 or a helicopter or a balloon or a blimp or anything. Or it could just be symbolic of the message that he has needing to be proclaimed from a vantage point that all can hear which is exactly what's going on here because this message that this angel directly overhead has is a message of the eternal gospel. Not something short term, not a blip on the radar, an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth. 
to every nation, tribe, and language, and people. All of them. All of them. That doesn't just mean people living right now. It means, as my friends in North Carolina like to say, everybody. The gospel is for everybody. Not just some. Not just those that have the money to look at relics. Not just those who are so religious that they can be in church all the time and purge their own sins, which they certainly cannot do at any rate. It's for everyone, this eternal gospel. Now, why is this lesson here every blessed Reformation service? This one lesson, Revelation 14, two verses, six and seven, in every single one since way back when those Lutheran reformer fathers put together the readings for Reformation Day, this was chosen. But why? Why this kind of strange reading from of all books, Revelation, which Luther himself early on couldn't even find Christ in? And yet here it is to be read and proclaimed from on Ref Reformation Sunday or Reformation Day. Here's why. Because those early Protestant fathers believed that this angel, this very angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim is none other than Martin Luther himself. They really believed that. They really thought that. Now, there's some uh, ammo for your theological shotgun. Martin Luther's in the Bible. More than that, the other two angels that are in this pericope were thought by those early Protestant fathers as being uh, no, none other than uh, Huss and Wycliffe, predecessors to Luther. Well, why is that important for us, you might ask? Did you, any of you ask that? No, I'm glad I asked it for you. Because we have an eternal gospel to proclaim. Because we join in with the angel flying overhead, whoever it might be. I like to think of it as being Luther. I like to think that, he, that God through him changed uh, the, the complexion of the church so much that we can proclaim the gospel now. But we now are part of that messaging system that God was using Luther and other angels, other messengers to proclaim the eternal gospel. Now, how many of you in here are catechism teachers? Raise your hands. Out of all the people present, we have a couple of pastors in the front pew, that's it, that teach catechism? Let me change my language. How many of you teach confirmation? Raise your hand. Oh, a couple more hands went up. See, I'm old. <laughs> I went to catechism class, not confirmation class. Okay, so how many of you teach Sunday school class? Raise your hand. A few more hands. Wow. I almost feel like I'm done here. <laughs> You have the opportunity to teach your children, whether they're in your family or in your neighborhood or in your church, you have the opportunity to teach this very thing that the angel, whoever he is, flying overhead is proclaiming. Because here's the eternal gospel. Fear God. You can pretty much sum it up right there. Law and gospel all combined right there. Fear God. That's the eternal gospel. Fear God and give him glory. Isn't that what we teach in catechism? Isn't that what we teach in confirmation? Isn't that what we're teaching in Sunday school to get kids ready for confirmation? Isn't that the explanations that Luther gives in the small catechism? We ought to fear, love, and trust God so that these things transpire. Why does he couch it in this kind of language? Because that is the eternal gospel. Not the one that's come along since Jesus, the eternal gospel, the one that's always been. Fear God so that God gets the glory. How do you do that? How do you fear God? So many of us have such trouble with that language, don't we? I love Jesus. Why would I want to be afraid of him? I love my dad too, but he had a paddle. For my good. 
and my mother's relief. We ought to fear God. He is the one who holds our future in his hands. We ought to fear him. But in order to give glory to him, we must also love and trust him out of that fear. This is what the scriptures teach us, is it not? Can we do that by looking at splinters from the cross and expecting the ears will be shaved off from some imaginary place of existence? We cannot. Can we fear God and give him glory by staring at a vial that has some kind of liquid in it and thinking that we're going to be forgiven of some sins after we die? We cannot. This is not the eternal gospel. This is no way to fear God. And why isn't it? Because it's taking matters into our own hands. I can't save myself. Luther discovered that he couldn't save himself, that no matter how religious he was, he felt more condemned than before. I was telling the Sunday school class here this morning that part of Susan's and my early time uh, in the church together, we went to church eight times a week, twice on Sunday, once each other day of the week. There wasn't a day in the week for years and years and years that we didn't go to church. Now, if you could do things to be saved, I would think going to church eight times a week ought to get you healthily along the way. But it didn't, and it won't. Who drove the furthest to get here tonight? How many of you drove uh, more than three hours to get here tonight? Raise your hand. Okay, so just just the, the front pew, about up towards the middle, and then up here. Right, how many of you drove more than four hours? I thought you rode. (laughs) You don't get points for that. That's my point. You don't get rewarded for that. You don't get points for that. How many of you came from another church besides this church tonight to be at this service? Raise your hands. Yeah, about a third of you. Sorry, no reward. (laughs) No points for that. No time off in purgatory. Doesn't gain you anything. But why do you do it? I hope that you do it because you fear, love, and trust the God of the eternal gospel. And you want to be near him and his people. I hope that's the reason. Because if you're hoping that you're going to gain something by doing so, that you're going to gain some merit with God, you're sadly mistaken. Because that's what our New Testament reading says tonight. By works, no human being will be justified to God. You won't be made right with God by how far you drive to church, by how often you go to church, that you come to church twice on Reformation Sunday. None of those things. And for those of you that actually truly do tithe, I mean tithe before the tax money's taken out, no points. Doesn't gain you anything. You are not justified to God by any of these works. We are only justified to God by the righteousness of faith, which means nothing that we do, nothing at all that we do, simply by the grace of God, a gift, a gift. No payment on your part, no payment on my part, no payment on the whole church's part. Simply a gift that's received, or as Melanchthon says in the Confessions, apprehended by faith. We apprehend God's grace by faith. There is nothing more passive. Nothing. Take a deep breath. Go ahead, take a deep breath. This is not some voodoo spiritual thing. Just take a deep breath. And think to yourself, do I believe? Do I truly believe in Jesus Christ? That's it, folks, right there. That's it. Nothing more than that. You believe. There is your salvation. By faith only. You didn't do anything just now. I mean, you took a breath. You believed. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Not that you put forward, not that the Pope put forward, not that some bishop put forward, not that some head of your local churches put forward. 
Not that the church put forward, but that God put forward. God put forward. Whom God put forward as a propitiation or satisfaction by his blood. Again, how to be received. How to be apprehended. By faith. That word is so clear, so final, that when Luther translated from Erasmus's Greek into germ, common German, he put the word in alone because by faith wasn't strong enough. It didn't carry the punch in German that it needed to have from the Greek. By faith alone, nothing else is to be added. Nothing. Not a hair from Jesus' beard, not a hair from Mary's head, not a splinter from the cross. And oh, by the way, in Frederick's collection, there was also a thorn from the crown Christ wore. And they verified that this is one that actually pierced his flesh and there was still blood on it. And if you believe that, there's some land down in Florida. It's pretty close to here. I've got it for sale. It's a real dream. Why did God do this? Why did God do all this? Why did he give us salvation as a gift? Why did he send his son to purchase that for us so that we didn't have to do it ourselves? To show his own righteousness, that's why. God's not interested in our righteousness. I heard uh, Dr. Jim Nestigan say uh, one time that somebody told him, I gave my life to Jesus yesterday. And Jim Nestigan said, I bet he was real impressed. God doesn't want your righteousness. He doesn't want my righteousness. He doesn't want our collective righteousness. He wants our faith in his righteousness, in the righteousness of Christ. I want to leave you with a thought from our local newspaper uh, in Alamance County, North Carolina. There's a, a local pastor that has been writing an article in there for years and years, He's on his way out, I think, because his son's photograph is showing up with his now, and it's written by both of them, and I look to the day several months down the road when his picture will kind of float off the page, and the suns will rise up, and he'll start writing. But this is what they wrote last week. The word for quiet, you know, when we read in the Old Testament, be still and know that I am God. That word for stillness, that word for quiet, means righteous. That's what it means. Be righteous and know that I am God. Be still. Be quiet. Shut up. Stop all the chaos. Stop all the running around. Quit trying to impress me, God says. Be still and know that I am God. Be righteous and know that I am God. Well, if I'm going to be righteous, i got to do something. No, that's just the point of what I've been telling you all afternoon. In order to be righteous, you're to do nothing. Think on that. What solid good news is that? In order to be righteous before God, you must do nothing. You are saved by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ. So you must do nothing. And in so doing nothing, know that he is God, not you. Amen. Fear God. May he be glorified in your lives.